Great. Thank you. I'm very happy when somebody introduced me in the language I don't understand. So I hope they didn't say any bad words, obviously. <laughs> I, I learned one word, tak. <laughs> that's, a, that's a simple Swedish word. Anyway, thank you for inviting me here and uh, met, uh, numbers doesn't matter because you have been also introduced to me as an expert group. So I, ex I also expect some uh, challenging questions after what I will present and I look forward to our conversation also. I planned uh, this presentation in a way that I will use my PowerPoints and I will show some videos and I will also use uh, these two great players, Alfie and Wille, to help me uh, with, some, uh, with some drills to demonstrate it also for you. So Wille and Alfie, you can go on the second court, have some fun with the ball so that you are ready, because I will not need you all the time. Um, yeah. Are you sure that it was good that you take uh, Technifiber because you are promoting now my brand? <laughs> and I don't know who, which is your sponsor. <laughs> great. So. Ground Stroke for the Future Champions is the topic that we will talk about. When I was uh, talking with Ula and Michael and Martin, they said it would be good that we actually touch this. Actually, one thing that everybody is learning by the level one course already, but it's uh, important from the be for the beginners as well for the top professionals. So I hope that you will appreciate actually the ideas that we will discuss. Anyway, I would like to start with a question for you. And can you find a partner? Just find a partner, because I would like you to discuss between yourselves. I will not ask you to tell me what, you, what is the outcome, but two of you have to make uh, your, own, your own, actually, answer. So who do you think from these three extraterrestrial players <laughs> are in average plays fastest forehand? Is it Djokovic, Nadal, or Federer? You see these uh, numbers very often in the, in the screen, yeah? What, how, how fast they play the ground strokes. But I don't ask you the number. I will show you later. But who do you think in average plays the fastest forehand? Djokovic, Nadal or Federer? Talk to each other in Swedish. I will not understand. I will not ask you what you say. But I would like you to reflect and actually... <laughs> not with me. You can talk. I have, I have a follow-up question. Yes. What do you mean by fastest? Okay, fastest means what we see on the screen. When they hit, they say they, he hit the ball with 120K. So that means after the contact. Okay, so ball spin after contact. After the contact. That's typically what we see on the screen. Okay. Okay. Smart ass. <laughs> I give you just a half a minute to find the answer for yourself. Okay, you have it? Did you make your decision? Okay, I'm, I'm not asking. So, I wait for Nicholas. <laughs> I hope you agreed between yourself, because I will give you the answer. I will not ask you the answer. So these are the numbers I found at the internet also, they're published. Uh, why put Nadal first? He has the same speed of the ball, horizontal speed, in average 127 Ks, but with more rotation, that, that means that after the bounce, actually the ball is, I, I would say, losing less speed. And big, that was the reason that Nicholas asked me before, what, which speed I mean, because with this, I want also to make you aware that when, when we hear a lot of statistics nowadays, it can be misleading. And I like a good friend of mine, Karl Myers, used the phrase, uh, statistics is like a bikini. You see many things, but you don't see the most important part. <laughs> so actually, you have to be very careful when you are looking at the stats and what it means, because, yeah, it's the same, but because Rafa is hitting with the 
um, uh, most of the spin, then after the bounce, the ball will be heavier. That's what we use as a coaches. Yeah? Actually, it means that we, actually the speed at the contact or after the contact is one element, but actually the speed at opponent's contact is actually even more important. There was a research some 15 years ago in which they were comparing Rusetskis and Sampras serve. Same direction, same speed, 205 Ks after the contact, but Sampras serve was 10% faster at the contact point because of the amount of speed, and it was 30 centimeters higher. So obviously, it's not only speed that matters. Uh, of course, there is another thing that is very important, because when we think about who is the most aggressive player, we would all agree is Federer, yeah? But his forehand, why is he for, his forehand is so effective? Because he's closer to the line, he actually takes time away, so the time between the my contact and your contact is actually shorter. So it's not only speed like Nadal. Uh, what uh, Djokovic is doing so well, he's obviously using the speed. He's great in actually taking the ball on the rise and use the opponent's speed. Because of that, for him, it's easier to play on hard courts than on very slow clay. And can we finish? And then with Nadal, actually, what he really can do, perhaps the best of these three, is to add the speed. When he gets a slower ball, he's the guy who can add most of the speed. So this is not only speed as itself, we have to see it a, a, bit, a bit more complex. Please, Nicholas. Well, that was, that was why I asked the question, uh, what do you mean by fast? Yes. Because if I play a ball, how fast does it come back? Exactly. This may not be Nothing. It's not enough. So this is just an introduction that uh, actually, when we look at the modern game and we see these stats with the speed, sometimes we don't really comprehend the whole, uh, whole uh, picture. And you will see why I'm do, uh, doing this as an introduction a bit later, and it's related to the technical development that I will talk about later. So let's look at the, one of the forerunners of the new generation. That was this year's in Mi Miami, stats, when Sinner was winning. And actually, you see that average forehand speed was actually 130 Ks. And actually, the difference between him and the second guy, actually, by the, by on the backhand side, is even bigger. Almost six kilometers per hour, it's a faster backhand than the next one, Korda. Again, another great young player. So, the purpose of this is to say, yeah, the trend in terms of uh, developing the game is that the players are trying to play faster. That's for sure some, one trend that we have to be aware about. So they need power in their game to be, a, uh, to be a successful. But of course, power is nothing without the control. You remember this uh, uh, message from Pirelli tires. And here on this screen, actually, what you see on, on these uh, verticals, uh, actually the amount of spin by the backhand shot and on the, on the axis, yeah, is the amount of spin that players are using in average in their forehand shots. So what is interesting here is actually to see two things. One thing is, you, I cannot point it because it's a screen. At the, here at the bottom left corner, uh, like uh, players like Deminor, Medvedev, then you're coming here after the Djokovic, okay? And that means that actually they play with less spin compared with guys when you look at the Federer, Imer, Imer is <laughs> right pronunciation, Sinner, look at Berrettini. How much spin he used in his forehand? That is a real weapon, yeah? And then you go up to the Tsitsipas, Federer. So what is the message, actually? When you look at the game styles of these players that I was just mentioning, like comparing them in or, Medvedev, Djokovic with uh, Federer, with Sinner, Nadal, team, is actually how aggressive they are playing their ground strokes. Actually, Medvedev or Deminor are more the guys that are using opponent's uh, pace and are actually more like a counter-attacker. The guys that really hit the ball and accelerate are actually using more spin. And this is actually very interesting because if you, some of you are young, <laughs> some of you are a bit older. So I would, if I, I would ask Ula, for example, for sure, he would remember even the guys like Manuel Santana. And they were the guys that were using a lot of spin. But at that time, such players were actually the guys that were counter-puncher. 
and the guys that were like McEnroe, offensive guys that play with less spin and flatter shot. So that's interesting development in tennis game, when you look at in terms of historical perspective. And why I'm saying that, because it's actually very important to understand it when we develop the ground strokes for the future. I think it's very important to understand it because aggressive tennis means that you play fast, but also with actually more spin, not less. So let's see what it means and actually how we can develop this ground stroke for the future. So I will be going very quickly through this, but for me, when I look at it, that you know, 10 and under, let's say age category, category is like a, a primary school. You have to learn the fundamentals. You have, you have to learn how to write before you write the novel, yeah? Second, under 14 players, or under 14 I would call age group, better to say, is the time to include, first of all, what I call offensive technique. And what it means, offensive technique for me is a phrase that is describing actually ability to hit on the rise. And one more very important ability, in my opinion, in that age to be developed is actually to counterattack down the line shots, especially on back and side from open stance. So you can stay closer to the line, baseline. If you are coming with your right, you have to go back. You understand? I believe you are good. So, so this is offensive technique because if I am open stance, down the line shot, turning the shoulders, I can go for the angles. It's a winner. It's a technique that will actually enable me to be offensive in my attitude on the court. And height power. The kids are growing. That's what I call height power. They get bigger swings, be more, much more power, uh, actually compared to the nine or 10 years old. So when they are 13, 14, they start really to hit the ball. And 15 and above means actually finalizing uh, your technique in, a, in a relation to your game style. Obviously, if you think about the player like uh, Ivo Karlovic, 210, and compare his technique that he has to actually uh, align with his game style with uh, Schwarzman, Obviously, it's different. We don't talk about, they have the same fundamentals, but then after 15, they have to align the, game, uh, the technique with their game style. And of course, it should be supported with a specific conditioning. What you want really to do in terms of technique, I'm talking now. I will not really talk too much today about 14 and 15, and about actually, I would follow, uh, actually I will focus on the 10 and under and uh, fundamentals, because that's something what we talked would be actually our topic today. In 60 minutes, you cannot cover everything. <laughs> and uh, so let's see. So what means fundamentals in 10 and under? First of all, after also re reflecting to how the ten, uh, modern champions are playing and what is the modern trend in our tennis, tennis as a sport, I would say the first thing is to develop right attitude. And I call it, uh, describe it as active uh, game style. Active game style. I, I believe all of you as a coaches would prefer that your players develop the attitude, I want to win the point and not to prevent, I am waiting for you to make mistake in order that you lose the point at the young age. What very often is actually much easier for the young players to wait for the opponent's mistake. Hit one more ball in, high on the back end, that's the winning tactics in nine and under or 10 and under. But later on, it's not what we want them to do. Second, actually is to add what I call tactical fundamentals. For me, this is high percentage tennis and actually applying appropriate tactical intention. We, you all know what means high percentage tennis. I don't need to explain it too much for you, for sure. I use for myself, actually, one simple definition. And that's actually where I'm starting with when I'm trying to also pass it to the players that actually high percentage tennis means what is consistent for me and demanding for you. You agree? But then it's still, that's a phrase that we can as a coaches use, but for the, co for the players, actually we would need to uh, use some other metaphors, but I, that will be another presentation, that we don't go too much in that details. Why tactical intention? For me, it's clear. And I will use now one metaphor for you. For you. Imagine that you have to go to the train station, okay? And train station is around 500 meters away, okay? You imagine now you go there. And if I say, okay, you have 15 minutes for 500 meters, how you would go to the train station? 
you don't take a car, so you would walk. But if I say you have two minutes, it means you have to run. So actually, if I intend to do something different in terms of intention and constraints in terms of time, actually that would directly influence my technique, my movement. So having appropriate intention and being aware about high percentage principles will actually bring the kids to the situation that they will make less stupid mistakes, unforced errors. And for all of you that are traveling to the international tournaments, even highest first category, Tennis Europe, you know that actually the winners are in that category, the ones that are making less stupid mistakes, unforced errors, not more winners. And I believe all of us as a coaches are aware about it and always try to teach the kids which are the shots that you would like, uh, we would appreciate for them to use. I sometimes call it like easy solutions or high percentage in our language. Technical fundamentals. In one sentence, I would like to define it like fundamentals for developing record speed in terms of power and control. There is one more. I will add it. I will not talk too much about it, but I think it's very important when we talk about uh, developing forehand stroke. Actually, having a let's call it fundamental skill of sideways throwing motion. I will come to this a bit later. That we don't now start and then later on repeat. So let's move on. I would like now to go start with the attitude. What means attitude for me and how to develop it? When you look at these six years old, these are two Russians, girls. What do you think? Do they have active attitude or let's call it waiting for the others to make mistake? Hmm? We're waiting. Waiting. And in terms of technique, do you, th do you feel that these two girls are able from technical point of view to direct the balls away from the opponent? Yes or no? Yeah. So this is what I mean that these girls are now practicing actually consistency bringing ball back tennis. And we were talking, yeah, but in, for the modern game success, you need to be active player. So I, will, I uh, put together one very uh, short film to give it the idea, in my opinion, how we can do it differently. Already in floor tennis, so I call it here bouncing tennis, you see that the kids at the age of six, seven, are not just rolling to each other. They're trying to aim away. So to create this attitude that I'm not playing to the coach, I'm not playing to my Opponent, I'm playing actually away from him. No need to say, it's more difficult when you have to run and hit back. <laughs> Obviously in red court it can come up, I would say up to this level, because they are really playing great tennis already on red court, yeah? And now they are actually, uh, I would call it consciously, actually hitting balls away from the opponent. The next one in orange court, again, what is possible, it's not standard, we know that. <laughs> Now the players at the orange court can actually create and use open space. What is the difference that at previous level they hit shot by shot. And when they mature, they can plan. So I, I open the court in order to hit the next shot to the other side. So that's a different quality because of cognitive maturation. And then actually when they come to the green court, green ball, actually they can use the depth of the court. Typically deep balls and short, like a drop shots are actually big weapons if they are able to control the ball. Uh, like this one, Lob. this is a, just an example of thinking what I want to share with you. So for me that means actually the philosophy for us as a coach is to be followed in, or, in order to develop what I call active game style and the right attitude. I want to be in charge of the point, not wait for you to lose. Tactical fundamentals. High percentage tennis for active playing style, because active playing style doesn't mean actually random hitting. You are looking at me, so... <laughs> what it, because when I talk about more about tactical development and emphasizing high percentage tennis, what you will see a bit later, now in a minute, actually I'm very often confronted with questions, but then they will be predictable. I will come to, the, to, to answer this question actually at the end of this part in a few minutes, okay? So, how it starts for me? On the red court, actually for me when the player is in a, on the right side, let's say in a favorable situation, when he's around the middle, doesn't need to run for the ball, 
I would like him to use already cross court shots to move the opponent. Log logical. No need to, to, conv to convince you, yeah? With cross court, I can make you run more than with long line uh, or down the line shot. So that would be the first idea. And how to do it? Actually, these kids are around seven. They are average kids. They played already one and a half year, twice per week. And the idea is you see these ropes in the middle. They have to throw the ball like starting the point with the overarm throw and then have to hit four balls away from the middle. So that's for me, for example, an ex uh, this is an example of technical training in tactical context. Because it's not really tactics, it's more like a directing. They're learning to direct the ball, but having an idea, okay, not to the middle. And uh, when they hit into the middle, then it's, it's stopped, yeah? Because we want to make them aware. You can hit where you want, but not to the middle. And obviously now it's important to connect it with first clue that they can really comprehend where to hit is actually with the op uh, opponent, now coach, actually position. So if I'm in one corner, that they recognize open space and hit away. You can also actually say that this is a technical drill. I just marked the, the target. But for me, it's again an example technique in tactical context. Because they're basically practicing uh, di different directions of the shots. And if you see how many shots they played and how many from there were down the line, did you count? I put perhaps one out of five. Mostly I have given them cross court. I don't want to explain, I want you to play always cross court. But I, when I'm positioning myself, I position uh, in a way that they have to play much more cross courts than down the lines. Because I want to emphasize this using and practicing of the cross court shots that are easier for moving the opponent. Now, well, oh boy. good footwork. Good footwork. You mean standing, <laughs> standing still. <laughs> That's good. Okay, now we are coming and we will ask the players to come. Can you call them? Can, okay. Yeah. So until they come, I will explain to you what means for me this uh, tactical fundamental high percentage. So high percentage is to move the opponent with cross court instead of down the line. It's easier, yeah? For all the reasons that you know. The second, actually, idea, you will be on this side. You can take some balls. And the guys will be on this, on this side here. Yep. So I will explain just you can also listen to me, please. And uh, if needed, Martin can translate in Swedish, of course, if English is not good enough from my side. So for me, the principle to play that I would like to teach first from the baseline, after making them aware about the advantage of the cross-court shots, is actually the principle from middle to the corners, from the corners to the middle. When you look at the top players, I think that they use this principle in 90% of the shots. So when I'm in favorable, favorable position around the middle, I want to dominate the point by hitting away. But when I'm in the corner, the easiest way to neutralize opponent's attack is down the middle. You are cutting the angles. And this is one thing that I would like to emphasize because very often, I call them tennis teachers, uh, saying you have to defend with a cross court. It's more difficult. When I'm under pressure, in order to hit cross court, I have to hit in front. And if I can, after your attacking shot hit cross court, I'm actually playing counter-attacking shot if I'm successful. But if it's short, then I'm in trouble. Okay? So just to give you the idea. Now, one drill that I didn't uh, record, I will ask Martin to do with them. Look. Now, Martin, you, you're on the other side. Yes. And you will play. So you will not just feed the balls. Yep. Come on. Go to the other side. You will come with me here. So you will, each of you will play one point with, uh, with Martin. And if you, you will not play point who will win. But you have a task, and I will try to demonstrate. So Martin plays the ball, OK? When the ball comes to the middle, you are, before the ball bounces, you call where you want to play the ball. And you can play the ball to the forehand or to the backhand, but you have to call. And if the ball comes to the corners, you have to play to the middle. And you can say then middle, also before the ball bounces, OK? Can you go a bit back? So I will demonstrate. OK. So what I should do? Actually, I would like you that you call for me. OK, you call together. One more time. You call for me. Yeah. 
A white middle. Ah, interesting. They are smart. I will not go. Obviously, they recognize the ball is very deep. So I like what you said. Good one. But now you try not to play very deep. So, and also you have to hit me some balls outside, yeah? So when you, when he hits outside, come on. No, outside. Okay. Okay, come on. You tell me. No. Middle. So when you're outside, then you have to play to the middle deep. Okay? Let's try it. Come on. Ready? Five shots. If you put, if you make five right decisions and you hit in, you got the point. Come on. We will make a point. Oh, stop, stop, stop. You have to say where you will play before the ball bounce. Come on. Stop. Okay, you count. Five shots. Okay? But when the ball is in the corner, where you have to hit? Uh -huh. Then you don't need to think. You just, when you see that the ball comes outside of the middle, you say middle. And, okay. Okay, stop. I see that Martin likes to run. Martin, change. Don't give them all the balls to the middle. One more time, that's it. Oh, stop, stop, stop. Make first ball not in the middle. I didn't say that should be in the middle, so make them look at the ball. Ah, yes, and go. Uh-huh. Okay, excellent, perfect. One more time for you. You don't need to play according to their shot. So you as a coach, you can make any decision you want. Very good. Okay, one more time, the same player. But can you be a bit louder? Uh -huh. Stop. When did you say? Uh, so, so, so. When did you say f forehand in the previous shot? By hitting or before ball bounce? When you have been hitting or when, when the ball bounced? Hitting. When you were hitting. Okay, thank you. So, actually, can you please collect? Uh, you, you can leave still, but collect the balls, please. Right? So why I'm emphasizing that this is a typical problem, actually, they make a late decision. And I want him to make early decision. I don't want him to practice like Federer, waiting <laughs> and including all the possible clues in, in his shot because that also will help him to avoid unnecessary mistakes. We know that when you make a change of your decision by hitting, good luck. Yeah? So, very simple drill that I believe can help you. You can make it even more simple for the guys. You can start it even on, I would call it red court, but then I would say they would also not think about where to play from, play from the middle. When you have average kids eight years old and they have to make a decision before the ball bounce, if they go for the forehand or backhand corner, you will see it's a trouble. So first I would say, okay, when you play forehand, you play to the forehand. When you play backhand, you play to the backhand to help them. So you can do it actually easier and you are helping them to simplify the decision-making process. Obviously, we are opening it. So this, can ha this should be, in my opinion, done with the good players, not the perfect players, already in orange court. I'm doing this on green because they are playing on green court. So that they feel also comfortable. We are using also green balls that they are using. But you can actually apply it already earlier on the orange court. Okay, let's move. Oh, up. Not this one. So what is the follow-up follow up on this is actually to understand when I can 
when I'm running to the ball to the corner, actually, or when I should play to the middle, neutralize or defend, how you want to call it, or actually create counterattack. So now I give you one minute and to talk to each other and think about what would be your clue for the player when he's moving to the corner, when he has to play back to the middle, or he's allowed to counterattack with the cross court. Talk to each other. 30, one minute. What would be the clue that you would give the, to the player? Come on. I will not ask you. I would, I would like you to think about it a little bit. Two of you. What would be the clue that you would give to, the, to a player? And these young players, not Djokovic. <laughs> That's a different topic. Okay, can you come? <coughs> You understand? Mm -hmm. So your clue is that actually before the ball bounces, when you are able to stop before the ball bounces and you run to the corner, then you, you are allowed to play cross-court shot. So in the corner, cross-court shot? Yes, but when? When you, when you are able to stop before the ball bounces. Mm -hmm. Okay? When you have to run when the ball bounces, because you are not in position, then you have to play to the middle. So don't run. Huh? Don't run. No. Um, Can you try to explain? Oh. In Swedish. När du samma handling, men när du behöver springa och slå slaget, då spelar du mot mitten. Så säg att jag slår ut mot din mm. Och så när du behöver springa och slå den, då sitter du mot okay. mitten. Men om du hinner liksom, du springer och så ger du bra balans, kanske stilla stående, okay. då får du spela den. Cross. Do you agree? Först du skinna den. Ja. Yeah. Okej. Okay. Mm, Vad sa du? Jag ska också säga ja. You don't need to say anything. He do, they, they doesn't have to shout. No, 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 no. I, because I will ask him to, then later on. I, you, I will ask you to do that. Okay? Go there. Okay. You have your. You have your clue. I don't ask which one clue did you do. I gave them one clue, but I will not tell you which one first. Okay? And let's see. I will. I don't know. I never practice with them. I just also explain by the words. So in, because I want to test you actually, not them. <laughs> so can you look at them? and say if they are making the right decision or not. I gave them one clue. Let's see if they understood me, first of all. I don't know. Okay, so start somewhere to the... Okay, but don't start to the middle. Okay, come on. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Do you agree with his decisions when he was on the run to the corner? Okay, you agree. Okay, let's see the next one. Okay. Okay, stop. Do you agree with his decisions? Uh, and don't, uh, please uh, distinguish between the decision and his intention and technique. And also in one shot, I'm not sure what, what he really wants because of the way he hits the ball. But my question for you is, but after seeing these two, let's say, rallies, what do you think I told them as, in order to help them to make a decision when to, after running to the corner to hit to the middle, or playing cross-court counter-attacking shot? To the, to the middle. No, no, but I gave them a clue to, to make a decision by themselves. I didn't tell them when. So when they are now running to the corner, they have also option what uh, uh, Wille used more because to Alfie, Martin gave very difficult balls. So he, had, he always went for the middle and that was the right decision. decision maybe. But what? What I gave them as a clue? No. Don't, don't describe. I gave them a clue to help. 
and uh, that they have to move forward back at the back end because Martin is not playing well. Great. So that uh, <laughs> that is. <laughs> Does it create uh, some space or some time? No, that's not a clue. I gave them before the kids. I, in order to help them, I have to make very simple, specific clue. Otherwise, they are lost in combat. Something with the bounce, maybe. Exactly. So basically, actually, what I ask them, and I will, I will ask them to say this to you. I ask them, when you are able to stop before the ball bounces, you can play cross court. But if you have to run when the ball bounces, that means that you didn't beat the bounce. We call it. Actually, then go for the middle. Okay, now make it one more time, guys. So when you, you when you, when ball comes to the middle, you play where you want. You don't need to say anything, okay? But when you have to run to the corner, if you are able to say stop, that you stop before the ball bounces, then you can hit cross court. But if you cannot stop, you don't need to say anything. But then you hit to the middle, okay? Let's go. He said stop. So, okay, one more time for, the, for Alfie. Obviously, I'm very happy that so quickly he got it. And this is good because he's a bit older. But that's exactly the time. How old is he actually, uh, Wille? You just play with him, play. Huh? Uh, 11. 11. Okay, so he's also a bit older because when I say, you see that's like a light green. So for me, you can start with this, with the good players at the age of nine, when they are moving from perhaps orange to green court. And then when you do it with younger players, it will take some time for them also to comprehend. Very good ones will be very quick in understanding. But the, the ones that are more like a regular players will take more time. But I believe we don't see too many of this also by club players 14 and under. So some players need much longer time and because of technique and footwork and so on. But I'm now talking about what is possible. But yes, if you, uh, if you practice in a group of six once per week, perhaps you will be able to do it at the age of 16. <laughs> so it's not about age. This is what is possible. And we, when we talk about future champions. OK, the last one. Just tell me. Ah, smart guy. Very good, very deep. Now he feels also already the depth. That is another clue, of course. OK, thank you very much. Big applause, please, for my players. Can you collect the lines, please? So, actually, I will finish here with the tactical, because for technical, I will need another half an hour. And I will just finish this without showing the drills. What comes after this, actually, counterattacking for me in my philosophy, is actually to teach the kids when they come to the 12 and under category to extend pressure. And extending pressure, the first, I would say, way to extend pressure is after good cross court to play down the line shot. And perhaps most of you are surprised. I will not practice this, even with the best players, this pattern before the age of 11. Do you agree with me? Be honest. Yes or no? Are you practicing with kids eight and under already cross court to down the line? Ask yourself. What, what is the reason for, for what I'm saying and for my philosophy? And say my philosophy. I don't want to say this is the only philosophy because I uh, emphasize this. When you consider what we see on the screen, actually to play after the cross court shot that came back cross court, not to the middle or toward around the middle, to play down the line, Actually, you have extremely small target. Because if I from here play a little bit inside, that comes to the, to the middle of the, or, or to the player on the other side. And this is so actually difficult to hit. You have to be very accurate. You have, and if the ball is like here on this diagram, deep, you have to hit it on the rise. And these are the reasons that actually that when we actually give this idea, I would say, and emphasize this idea better to say to the young players, they make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> because in down the line, actually it's risky. If I don't really create advantage, the guy will make me run like a rabbit on the other side, if he's a good one. <laughs> so 
in my philosophy in developing active players, I add it later, when I know that my players have good enough accuracy that they can do it, that they are smart enough to understand and can distinguish between creating advantage and finishing the point with down the line. Because that's the problem. They usually try to finish the point with first down the line shot. I mean, when you talk about that high percentage, mm -hmm. of course, when you go down the line, there's a lot of things at your disadvantage. But to, to learn the shot down the line, even if it's a small target, I put it into a high percentage down the line shot. Mm -hmm. That means I put it, I say to them, play a little bit higher, yes. play a little bit yeah. away from the line, so that they create the change of contact from mm -hmm. the score to down the line. I'm not against it. And yeah. when they pra practice with me, they play, practice a lot of down the line shots. Now I'm talking more about which is the tactical pattern you would like them to apply in the matches. And this is now the, a little bit of playing with the players. I'm not against practicing down the line shots. Uh, one combination, typical Spanish drill, I like to do a lot with actually kids, good kids from the age of nine. So played the ball two meters behind the baseline cross court or deep when I'm standing here at the so I'm standing here as a coach. I say, play the deep ball to me. That means cross court. And then next ball is short. I want you to play down the line. And then go back deep, down the line. So it's not about not practicing. But the question is, which uh, way we want to give to the young players to win the points? And here I would like to just warn you, cross court to down the line pattern is the very risky pattern. You have to be very accurate. You understand what I mean? And of course, you, you have to look at the players individually. If he can do it, don't tell him, don't, don't do it. <laughs> so I'm not against this pattern, but be aware about the re, uh, actually role. But if you use the right materials, for example, red balls and red courts, and, and, or the big balls, these two are the first uh, players you show in the beginning. Yeah. They were playing down line also because they use the right balls and the right materials and then you can do it. Even here, actually, do you call this down the line or how you call it? If the player is here around the middle and play from here, forehand here, is it for you down the line shot? You see now, that's from here, I have no problem that, that they're playing actually uh, toward, from, with forehand to backhand. But when they are outside, to, and then to play inside this corridor, not many eight, nine years old players have this accuracy. So the, so the good rally in the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. They were playing cross court mainly, of course. They were yeah. doing. But sooner or later they will do it. Yeah, of course. Line. But of course. Because of the materials look, they can do it. And if you saw also this one, so here she is playing already down the line shots. So it's not about avoiding down the line shots, but not. Uh, how to say, not to emphasize this winning pattern, as a winning pattern. I see too many kids are actually thinking about winning points by changing from cross court to down the line when they are close to the line. You understand what I mean? So it's not avoiding of forbidding. Even though when you look at traditional Spanish coaches, no down the line. That, and that was actually what they changed recently in last years because before, when you remember Bruguera and these types of players, that was 99% was cross court. So when you, he played first deep, and when the ball was a bit neutral, then it's even more angled and waited for the down the line to play to the other side. But that changed now. The, with this, uh, only this like a cross-court pattern, you are not good enough. So I believe you have to really add down the line pattern, let's call it like this, from the age of the 11 as a playing pattern in a match. You understand what I mean? I hope you understand what I want to say. So 11... And, and above, this is very important to be added, because if you don't have it, when you move to the 15 and above, you are killed. After 15 plus and at international level, without high quality pattern, cross court to down the line, and you are not taking the first chance, you have no chance, especially girls. So I'm not against it, but we are talking about the kids, fundamentals, if you remember what is there. Okay, may I move on? Because... I hope uh, until the lunch at 12 we are finished. <laughs> so, when I talk about technical fundamentals, first thing that is important for me in my philosophy is to create stable stance. And I believe we all agree that it's, I would say, the, the fundamental for actually having a power and control, both. But what, is, what it means for me in terms of what I really want to achieve is to 
bring the players to, have, to find the appropriate distance. Finding appropriate distance actually will enable young players to have a good and stable stance during the stroke. Second, I call it quality contact. That means hitting through with a sweet spot around the middle of the racket. Adding spin for control. And then here I use, actually, this is a phrase from the Spanish coaches. And why I'm saying that? Because in Spain I was really surprised when I came 25 years ago there to Bruguera, I never hit, uh, hear, sorry, I never heard Bruguera to say to any player or any of their coaches to spin the ball. But you, but you uh, hear a lot this phrase, hit forward, finish up, but not to spin the ball, even though they play with a lot of spin. And after that, of course, I would call it power means for the kids adding distance by adding trunk rotation and the leg drive. So additional thing that is technical, but it's for me more motor skill, is this sideways throwing motion that I will come to the end because I think it's very important and perhaps it will lead us to one hour discussion. You will see why I say that. Great, so let's start. Stable stands. I use some videos because I believe it's easier if you really see the guy, he's six year old, so he's trying to find the distance with the back foot. If you, if you look at his feet, his position, his back foot, in order to find the distance to hit through a... Actually, did you re realize he has a racket with a hole in the frame? So that he has to... I will make it one more time for you. So that he has a hole in the frame here. So when he hits through the bar, you see that he has to actually find the right position that he, this hole is actually able to be able to sw be swinged actually at the right position at the contact point around the middle of the racket. So, but the idea is here that actually he connects the swing but to, be, to position himself to the actually uh, contact point. How I can make it more difficult? That's a basic drill. How I can make it more difficult? Because it never happens like this in tennis that you will get exactly that spot on the forehand and exactly that spot on the, on the backhand. Trusting. 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 Well, dropping the ball. Okay, but I would like to, to, to have the same drill, not changing a drill, that's a different drill. But I would now make this drill more variable. I can say the color, okay. Or I can move the cones. So that he has to find different distances. So that it's not always the same distance. So I just move the cone. You understand, yeah? So that he has to find different distances, that means he will have to intuitively find different combination of the, uh, of the steps. Okay? Another one. And you will see uh, this one. That was first time when they tried. Actually, they have to connect now, actually split step, when the ball hit to the wall. And then to fi find a way that they catch the ball on one hand. But none of them have really understood that actually they have to run to the ball and stay. They, they were jumping because that, that it took time. Actually, one or two the practices and then they got it. That they can run and then stay on one point, on one, one leg. Yeah? Because they're all, you see, they try, to bounce on the, they try to bounce on one leg instead of coming and then standing on one leg. But that was really the first time when they tried this drill, yeah? And after half a year, they, they played it. So they have to find the distance and keep the balance on one leg, back leg, when they are hitting the ball. Why the back leg? Why not on the front leg? The first guy there, he had the left foot first, and the second day he had the right foot. Yes. Yes, we, uh, he didn't get it. He didn't get it. <laughs> but why I emphasize back leg, not front leg? Because it's, it's so logical if you are here, and that, that, that will actually, when you add a bit more speed, actually you will transfer the body weight into the ball. Once when you have your uh, body weight on the front leg, you cannot use body weight anymore in the shot. I mean, I mean, he changed. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> but 
you could see that actually these kids uh, uh, had got the task that they find the distance. The here main idea for me was why this drill is to find the distance because if you are not at a good distance you will not be able to hit the ball with the racket okay and this guy was actually letting the ball a bit too low you saw it also yeah so it's not perfect it was a learning time so I don't want to show you like a Hollywood <laughs> because this is a life or like the kids don't get it first yeah the drill so uh, you have to repeat to show and practice it's not about in one minute that it's a magic drill no way. I don't know the magic drills. <laughs> quality contact point is the third one. What it means, quality contact point? So for, for me, this kid is around six. I want to make him aware that you can see the ball on the strings. And this is the idea. Yeah, you put it so that he has to tell me. I, I tell him the uh, right, middle, left ball, and he has to then hit different balls and say that he saw the ball through the, through the strings. So he say, yes, you don't hear that. He says, tuck. <laughs> when he sees that ball that I, and then he uh, look at me. But now he has to say the same thing, that he sees the ball through the strings by hitting. I will make it one more time, th this uh, here. It will come to the end. OK. I think, OK, it's here. OK. OK. So now I'm asking him to show me that he understood, yeah? What I want you to say me, yes, is that you see the ball through the strings. I have to find the right. Okay. What is here the problem? It's low. It's not the, the height that we as a coach would like to have. It should be a bit higher. What is good, where he's looking, He's really looking for the contact point. And he's trying to see the ball through the, uh, through the, through the strings. I know that they, he will not be a federal. <laughs> but uh, what is the reason for asking him to do that? It's first of all, to bring the contact point in front. Because if I want to see it through, I have to bring it intuitively in front. And also, another very important element in quality contact point is actually to get a feel for the uh, vertical angle of the racket. In order to hit through, your angle of the racket should be like this. And that's the problem. He doesn't have it really. Now, I will ask these two, our two players to come, because I would like you to see also by them here what is happening. Let's see if they can do that. Because if he is really doing this right, he will have the contact point in front with per per perpendicular racket face. And that's what is actually preconditioned that you can hit through. When you open the racket face, what happens? We lose the control, actually. With this, you hit through, but you also control the ball. With a, you can also say that you are at the same time practice concentration on the ball. See the ball in the context. It's so important, yeah? not look on the other side. OK, guys, I would like you to try one drill. And you will play each of you with uh, Martin. And you will play here from the service line. But look. Can you stay here behind me? Just behind. Just here. Next, next here. And look, what I would like you to see that can you see the ball through the strings at the contact point? Okay? And tell me yes or no. Come, come next to him. Okay, here. closer, closer to each other. <laughs> yes, like this. Sorry. Yeah, okay? You tell me yes or no loudly. bit higher ball because I have to go much into the knees uh -huh. okay now you will play and you will tell me if you can when you play if at the contact point you can see the ball actually through your strings okay each of you play four four shots with the... oh no if not okay one more four shots only Okay, good. Perfect. Stop, stop. Next one. You count the shots. Four shots, change. Uh -huh, no. And if you look at his eyes, you can also control if he really did it. 
you as a coach can really check. Because very often, what will happen, but they are doing well, but they are much better than the guy where I'm really doing this, yeah? When you open the racket, you don't see the ball through the strings, you see them on the strings. So I'm asking the player, I, did you see them through or on the strings? So to make aware about actually the open or closed racket face. But they already have also Western grips, so for them it's not, not a problem. But really? Uh -huh. now, because when it's down here, he cannot see. He's lying to me. Yeah. When the ball is low, I know that he cannot see it through. So you can check and really ask him, okay, did you see or not? Okay, but we don't want to criticize them. Uh, now yes, okay, perfect. Good? Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one. It's hitting through. Six years old. They cannot play actually on a, on a red court. But for me, that's very important and I would say different way of thinking. Why? Because usually we ask the kids to play over the rope. For me, I want them to play below the rope. And look, at, look at why. And it's not perfect. It's not Hollywood again. <laughs> and this is not Max Federer. This is just my son. Poor guy, because he had to try so many different drills <laughs> for testing and <laughs> experimenting. No, I think they had the fun. Uh, so when I make it like this, slow, OK? So the, the point is to hit below the rope. It would be, for me, even better if I would have a roof, so that for the kids it's more visual, to hit under the roof. And look at his racket movement now, what he's trying to do. Forward. Hitting through, forward. It's not perfect, it's too short, and he will never make money, so don't worry. <laughs> but uh, I think even the regular guy playing twice per week in a group in this setup, but with this drill, what you are emphasizing is really hitting through. And what will happen by the next shot on the backhand side? Okay. You see now, he's opening the racket. When he opens the racket, it will go over the rope. So what I want very young kids to really feel already is the way that they orientate the racket at the contact. And I would like to, hit, to teach them first to hit through not to hit up, if you agree or not. But what is very important here? Yes, the roof, but also that here you don't have high net. Red court net is too high. For red court net to play like this, you have to already be able to add spin. When you are so small, because they're so small, they're six. So in red, red court net is like that for them here. So if you really want to teach it, you have to make obstacle much lower so that they are not afraid of hitting into the net. Because the, the kids are smart, they are looking for the easy solution to achieve the goal or task. So if you really want to develop it at early age, you have to think about the height of the obstacle. The higher the obstacle, for them it's easier to, to, to hit over actually by opening the racket. So it can be better to, <laughs> to hit in the, into the net because you do. Also, yes, that can be, uh, yeah. Can be, uh, uh, you can play with this idea. Yeah. So how you will achieve it? This is just one drill. One drill can be, can you hit one below, one up? I mean, I know what I mean, but uh, it's better to play like you said, like it's, uh, it's better to... Yeah, so hit, do you agree? If you want to develop a player, would you like to make him hit through yeah. or to yeah, push up? And, but I said, very important is the environment. If the net is too high, it will be difficult for them, almost impossible. They will open the racket face. So that's something for you to think about. Uh, okay, before I move here, one more drill that I'd like to sh share with you. And actually, Michaela was wondering why I asked her to provide me with this pump that I have, have here. Is, okay, can be on backhand side. Can you make a slow swing? And when you, when you come to the pump, I, I would like you to press and then go up, okay? And then for up, okay, one more. Up. You agree? One more time, one more time. One more time, because actually, 
uh, uh, he can do it. Actually, the, the length of hitting through is around 10 centimeters. It's not my measurement, it's, they were by mechanics. They did it, and actually what they, what they found out is around 10 to 20 centimeters, so it doesn't matter. This is perfect one, so Michaela found really perfect one. <laughs> I didn't, and this is great because it's bigger here. I liked when I use the bicycle pump, what I ask you first, then I put usually like a ball so that they understand it's a ball, yeah? That I'm pushing through and then go up, okay? Go, oh, but you have to come touch and push. Uh huh. Now you want to hit the ball forward or upward? Okay. Uh huh. Come, up, and then when you when you press, then you go up. You don't need to rush. And up. Okay. I can one one more time. Whatever do really. Then after this, when he press, I will put take it away so that he doesn't need to go uh, perpendicular. That he can move forward. Great. So for me, this is a great tool to make them aware, because otherwise. How you, can re how you can really explain this feeling? You cannot explain. I think all, all of you that are good players, you, you, you can feel it, but how to explain to the kid that doesn't feel? O almost impossible. So you have to find something like this. And also you can play a little bit. Can you make one more time? Now, look, I would like you now to actually press one, the, like you play down the line, and then the other one for cross court. Okay, and where you would be cross court? You feel what he's doing intuitively. He's finding also different contact and pushing in different direction. I see so many also good kids that when they come to the ball, they don't really control the ball. The racket is, uh, how to say, I, is not disciplined in the contact. It, it, it goes left, right, up, down, and they look any real good player. It's like the, the racket is staying in the contact point and really just going simply to the, to the target. It looks so simple yeah? <laughs> when you can do it, but it's not easy to develop. So let's move on. We are coming to the next one. I'm rushing a little bit, 10 minutes more. It's about control. Without saying anything, I will ask the kids to, do, to solve one task. Okay. Are you ready? Uh, Martin, you will be here yep. on this side. Okay. I will not show you how to do it, or what to do. But from here, I would like... So you place the ball here behind. Okay, uh, sorry. And now you have to hit the ball in a way on the, on the floor. It should, you should not hit up. So the ball should not go like this to the goal. You have to find a way that you hit the ball that the ball comes into the, into the goal here on the other side. Who, who will try first? Wille or Alfie? Doesn't matter. Forehand, back? No, no, with racket. <laughs> you are tennis, so with forehand or backhand? Okay, one more time for the Wille. Put it behind. Okay. Oh, oh, not through. You have to find a way that the ball comes around this, yeah? Uh, wait, wait. I'll make like this, okay? Uh, behind, not put to the side. <laughs> uh, okay, he's looking for the right solution. You feel what, he, what I want them to discover, yeah? With forehand. We try with forehand, it's easier, with forehand. But what you have to, hmm, what you have to do, how the ball has to go, it should go like this, yeah? What you have to do with your racket that the, the ball goes like this. Can you try? Try it one more time. Ah, what you are trying to add to the ball? Spin. Spin. So actually, I would say for the, and then if the kids really understand that, can I try for you? They are a little bit shy. Why they cannot really hit it? Because they are too slow. Because if you really want to create a spin, you have to accelerate the racket, not push. Yeah? So if I would now show that, okay. Hmm? Can you try one more time until I talk? So basically, when we talk about control and adding spin, usually as a coaches, we are talking about movement, technique. But really, to, for the kids, I believe a very important thing is to understand why. 
Because otherwise they don't know why they practice it. We know, but they don't know. <laughs> and I found it also with the group of my son. It's most difficult things for them to really, at the age of seven and a half, eight, when you start to edit, in red court perhaps, that they understand why. Why I should spin. What is so logical for us, for a seven, eight years old guy, is not logical. Perhaps for Martina Hingis. <laughs> she was much, much more advanced, as you know. OK, so a few drills. OK, thank you. Yep. So adding spin. So after understanding what is very important, one more ball, I would like to give you some ideas. So in terms of technique, I believe it's very important that already at age of six, seven, when you are moving to the, or on the red court, that the kids actually have a fluent transition from back to forward swing. If you want to develop spin, I said, you have to develop racket speed. You cannot develop it with slow racket. But racket speed for the kid, for me, it's not really arm speed. It's about the technique so that you connect in a fluent swing. Very simple way is actually, for me, a forehand volley, a so forehand drive volley after self-feed. And here is already like a next step when they start, and then they have to add to, to follow up with a few more shots. But obviously, it's much easier with a coach who is then setting the next ball. And you can see the first one, he has no problem. But then the second one, he makes like typically down up. Yeah? So that was really a process of learning. It's not easy, and it's not always uh, in the first session that they will do it. But one more time. And what, what you could see here, because he's doing first, and that's very important. By uh, Can you guys take some balls and make some also dry volleys? Can you, uh, can you bring for them the balls, Martin, on this side? So what I want to emphasize by this drill, because it can be really very effective drill, but if you are doing this in the right way. Now, I will ask you, can you make a, a dry, forehand dry volley after the self-feed? You understand what I wanted to do? You can give them some balls on your racket. So, OK. Uh, one or two balls in the hand. So you see what he's doing. You see, he's not doing what you saw. What is the difference? But in terms of, I said it's important, self-feed. Take a look. Wait, guys. I want you to see one more time and take a really good look in how the, how the kids are doing that. Uh, OK. OK. Even better forward, I will go here. Sorry. OK. Take your one. Next one will be good. I want him to start. He doesn't want to start. <laughs> okay, let's wait. Okay, next one is coming. Now take a good look. No, but one more thing. What he's doing first? He toss or he go first backwards with the racket? Actually, advice is that it's very important that Martin, can you show to them? They bring the racket in the contact and not here. That's important because if the racket is first back, then you don't get the fluent swing. So bring the racket in the contact and ask them to toss and then to hit the drive volley. Can you show them? Let's see if I was able to explain. Can you show? Can you show them? First toss, then move the racket. I want him to also. So you see, he also wants to move the racket first. First toss, and then hit. Exactly. Next one. First toss, and then hit. And what is the difference? It's a huge. And then make a, make a move. First toss. Come on, great. What is the difference? Fluent, but one more thing is also very important. And we as a coaches fight with this a lot, make a lot of money on this mistake. Big backswings. 
So if you toss first, no kid will make a big swing because he's afraid that he will be late. So it's very important when you, if you use this that you really emphasize first toss, then hit. Because automatically he will not make a big swing. If he goes first with a racket, you will see that he increased the swing. And that's not what I want to develop. I don't want to develop big swings. I want to develop fluent movement and acceleration toward the contact point. Yeah? Okay, uh, now it's very different. So this is, I think, very... Okay, perfect. I like it. And what is else happening now? Can you make one more time? He did something great, and it's leading us to something very important. Can you make one more time? Because he wants to hit hard, what he added to the shot? One more time. They don't see. <laughs> With what? You are showing, but they say. With trunk. He, he find out that actually now if he want to add power, he's using his trunk rotation. I don't say, and if you would look at him one more time, you would see also that he's seven, regular player, but he, because he also want to hit harder, without saying him, because just of setting the situation, he was looking already to include trunk into the hitting, the, uh, hitting harder, even though I didn't ask him. Okay, and here one more thing that is important, and when we talk about the spin, is, you see now, the drill, it's a dry volley, but what do you think, why I put the, the basket below? Spin, it's not related with the, uh, with the trajectory of the racket. Amount of spin is not depending on how low is your racket. It's actually related to the trajectory of the ball. If you want to play higher with spin, then you will go lower with racket. So when you look at uh, the, can you follow what I say? Is, yeah. You agree? Because you are thinking? Because that's actually a very big mistake. If you bring the racket b below, you are then going up, but then you don't really create hitting through. The difference between Nadal and the rest of the players, he doesn't go lower with the racket when he hits. Go to any of his, but of course you have to see which shot he wants to hit. For the same height, he doesn't go, go lower than the rest. What he's actually doing differently that just be, before the contact, his racket is going more vertical. And that he really can make this so fast, it's unbelievable skill. But he doesn't go lower. He is just faster and he is more like a upwards. So it's much steeper angle just around the contact. And this again that by mechanics found out. So I follow, if I lie, then I got wrong actual information, but I don't believe it. So that's actually also one thing to be understood that adding more spin doesn't mean that you have to go lower with the racket. It's an acceleration and how steep it is this last uh, last part of the racket movement over the ball. But isn't it also a bit connected to a contact point where you hit the say the ball, like when you ball here. You can hit the ball here, you can hit the ball a little bit lower, you can hit the ball a little bit higher. So we, when you contact here, when of course you spin a little bit less, even even if you fast here, but if you, like I explained also on the, always on the kick serve. I can, I can have mm -hmm. a kick serve from 9 to 1, or I can also have a kick serve okay. from 10 yeah. to 2, but it creates less. Yes, of course. But do you see, feel really, because the ball is round, that you are hitting here and go here, or it's more about the racket trajectory? And actually, the contact point where you hit is behind. Like, you, you want to hit here. You don't want to hit here or there, because if you hit here, then it will go down. But the racket trajectory, exactly, go up. So that's what, what, what Nadal makes. He hits here, but then he goes up. And he goes much steeper and faster upwards than most of the players. And you, oh, that's, that's another drill uh, that for me actually brings the players, I didn't really deliberately uh, press it. Because I want to connect spin with hitting through. If you have to ro uh, pu push the wheel to round, uh, to, sorry, to, to rotate the wheel, you have to press and go up. 
it's not brushing. If you really want to connect, yeah? Adding spin. It's not spinning the ball, it's adding spin. And obviously this guy is okay because he's behind the contact point and he's too much in front. That's the reason why he has a problem. That was also first time when they tried. That was first time when they tried this uh, idea. So, yeah, when, when the contact point is in front, it's much easier. You can connect power and control. When it's behind, then the guy has a problem because he has no power. Okay. Well, we said that, that one. Uh -huh. Against the top spin pro, we have seen uh, the top spin pro with a mm -hmm. tennis ball like uh, the is that that a longer contact zone, also with a bigger wheel that you want to have? Uh -huh. That bigger wheel will provoke? Yes, I, I agree, yes. So you can play with the idea. <laughs> yes, true. And this is one right I talk, but now because of the time. Okay, very quickly. We try and then you will try, guys, what we do. So this is one additional, but for them perhaps it will be too heavy. You have to find, so I, I hit, you have to... Actually, uh, hit it to me, then I will show you what you do. Make, make the same. Hop. Uh -huh. I don't want you that. So you have to put it here and back. Stop. Okay. Play with them a few more. But for them, it will be a bit too heavy. So the, the, the weight of the ball should be appropriate. But actually, I want them to really feel push and rotation, not just brushing. So the, yeah. the idea in the future is like actually not going really deep. Yes. It's just coming actually more or less straight and deep. Exactly. And, moment of contact, like you go into, but you play, and then you accelerate up. This is like the modern yes. kind of strong It's You hit through and finish up. And by this movement finishing up and accelerating, accelerating upward, you are adding spin. But we, let me say, it's also, not because of the swinging, yeah? But there's, of course, also different court positioning. Like you say, I'm in the defense, you know, the opponent pressure. Yeah. Forward. It's a different exactly. story. Then Ex right? different, different story. Yeah. That neutral zone. Yes. That kind of aggressive in the modern tennis. I have to go like. Exactly. You remember when I said one of the key thing is that you that they apply the right tactical intention. Yes. Tactical intention for me is the key word that is combined uh, the connecting tactics with techniques. Because exactly the, my technique will change. There is no one movement. But now I'm talking about fundamentals. And when I want to add spin for the kids, it's important for me that they don't... I don't want to make this one. Yeah? This is spinning the ball. No power. We have a friend called Henry Pastienza. Yeah. And you, you have seen him. I know him very well. I have to see him in his spare time, whatever. He always go like this. <laughs> and they are quite... They are brainwashed in Belgium. They're doing... It. Like this, not like this. But in the spare time, whatever he's <laughs> Go forward, yeah? But yeah. they're doing it with multi skills when mm -hmm. I'm five or six years old, yes. whatever they do. Yeah. yeah. So they start early. It's very important. It should be, become automatic. If you have to think about it, forget it. And you have to, according to different tactical situations, what you want, you will adapt it. So it's not, there is no one movement in tennis, for sure. There is no one forehand. Okay, very quickly. Adding distance, five minutes more. Is it okay? Adding distance. What for me means adding distance is just touch. And actually, by this dry volley, the drill, they will actually uh, find it out immediately that in order to add power, if, you are, if I have a short swing, I have to add my trunk rotation. And here, it's more one drill for six years old. Okay, one is running around, but the other guy is actually turning his trunk left, right, it's more for me dissociation, we call it dissociation, that he feels actually this movement at all. First movement is not really hitting with the trunk rotation. Not possible, yeah? But this one perhaps is pretty interesting. And we did it later with the pedal because we realized this was also first time because it's very thin, tiny, it's difficult to hit, yeah? But when you take the pedal, then you have a bigger... Uh, space and then it's much easier, to, it's more fun for them. But actually, look at now, because it's about them, of course, I like very much to connect it with core control and balance. When you have instable thing, then you have to use your core to control. And we know that it's, but that's another topic to talk about. But here, I think very important because here he has to do one thing with his legs to keep the balance and actually with the upper trunk 
to dissociate because it's a totally different movements that have to be connected together. The best guy in the world, I believe, in tennis is Djokovic. When you see him by returns, yeah? that body is like going in different ways, and the ball is hit with such a control, unbelievable. It would be great to have every player, but it's <laughs> not so easy to, to achieve. But I would say this is the way at a young age to practice control, core control, with actually adding trunk rotation or sense for the trunk rotation. And now, when you come back then on the court, I like this drill to connect trunk rotation with the arm movement. Why I put the ball? Because on the backhand side, typically the, all the kids are using trunk because you are connecting both uh, with the racket both uh, arms. When you do the same without the ball on the, on the forehand side, what will happen that elbow is blocking you, yeah? But when you use this one, and you can, can you play with them? And, okay, so I ask this because when I do that, then I have a natural position of my elbow. So you can just do a few things uh, here. You're on this side also. A so, uh, few shots. So I believe this is very important. Why? Yeah, because when you have it here, you keep na na natural. I would call distance of the elbow. And why it is so important? Which is another mistake that we make a lot of money on? It typically with 12, 13 years old girls. How they play forehand when they start to use trunk rotation? How the forehand looks like? Do you agree like this? So playing around. And then you say, hit up. But actually, what is the problem? Problem is to actually distinguish that actually your shoulders are rotating in horizontal plane. But arm has to rotate in vertical plane. So when you see this, now what they do, if they don't have this skill, a coordinative skill, then they ba basically rotate the shoulders and arm in the same plane, in horizontal plane. So with this drill, like this, uh -huh, he, but can you, can you swing? Yes. Uh -huh, you see what he did now intuitively? Oh, come on, swing and hit. Swing and hit. If you miss, it doesn't matter. Yes, you see that he's pushing to the left, yeah? Instead of up forward. Okay, Wille, now you try two times, uh, but look, you have to put it, look, between the, this hand and here, not up there. The ball should be here on the hand, down, down at the grip. Yes, here. Hop, and uh, you, you see that he wants to swing around. One more time. Come on, give him nice high ball. <laughs> ah, better. And if I want to emphasize, wait now. Now I would like you to make this look without the ball. You make like this and throw the ball over his head. But without hitting the ball. No, no, you take here and throw the ball. You understand? You don't understand. I have to show. Wait, wait, no, no, no. I have to demonstrate, yeah? So look at me. I would like you to pass up. Take it, take it, go, go away. Oh, I want you to make this. Demonstration is always a very important part. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Good. One more time. One more time, Vile. Try to throw over his head. Okay, I want to emphasize up. So now you see shoulders are moving here and arms in the different plane. And without that, it's very difficult really to get, to include really shoulders in the right way. But you can also like, well, you sometimes just like, but they carry the racket, like with the left arm. You know, if you want that upper body rotation, yeah. actually, there's racket. See, please. So like that, that they actually carry the racket. Yes. So when you make sure yes. that you have that kind of... Yes, just give some ideas. I don't say these are the only drills. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's go, and to finish. And I have some other, but I have to sh shorten it. So this is the last. And uh, yeah. just bring them here, please. Uh, they will take on one ball each on this side, and you will be on the other side. They will not need the racket. Now, in order to make it quicker, Sideways throw, 
it's for me very important, especially when we, we think about developing more than forehand. On the backhand side also, but I would need too much time to, <laughs> to combine. So take a look at this. Just a short video. I will not comment. I will just now give you two, three videos to, be, to see without saying anything. Just observed sideways throwing motion. Look at this guy. Totally different technique from the first one, you remember? I will not explain at the moment. Another one. Vortex ball. You are familiar with vortex ball? This is like a ball that you see. Can you see it, how it looks like? If not, you have to come closer. Is it the one that looks like a rocket? Yes, yeah, like a rocket, yeah. That is half a year later or something like that. And you could see already an improvement. I would, I would say you see the improvement here already. And I will end up with the last one. Throwing the racket. And now I make it frame by frame. Again, on instable place, automatically they look to find the right, uh, not straight legs, yeah, what we hate, all of us. But look at now, I will try to be very precise. Oh, sorry, here, I have to be very precise. I, I told, told you that he's average motor talent. He's now growing like a mushroom, but that was when he was, he was not nine years old. When we did this like a drill, for me, this drill is not to teach them this forehand at that age, but to develop what I call motor pattern. When you look at this, what he did here, he has a slightly more, let's say, uh, rotating shoulder backwards, so to use more elastic energy here. He's actually preparing the racket at the side. And from here, he's using what we call, yes, whipping motion to accelerate. Actually, whipping is sideways throwing motion because if he wants to uh, hit the ball with the racket, he has to throw it. And one more thing that will open another discussion is it's important. Why? Because very often the kids are tensed. If you want to throw the racket, you have to relax. If you want to be fast, you have to be relaxed. If you want to explain to the eight-year-old kids what it means to be relaxed, good luck by words. <laughs> so I found it very Interesting because you can see now also here what is will happen. Oh, ah. Look at how he was actually really extending the arm, what you all believe is pretty important, using shoulders, whole hit, uh, throwing motion into the shot. Why I'm emphasizing that? And it, as I said, can open a long discussion, but. You, you, you are hearing pretty often nowadays about ATP and WTA forehand. That's the difference. Actually, that's the difference. Ask how many girls. Uh, this is a, like a kid's game. I believe you're also doing this on your legs and in the sea. When you take a stone and you throw the stone that the bo and the, it should bounce on the water. I don't know. We call it like frog. <laughs> yeah? And how many girls can do that? If you ask the girls typically to do that, they will not be able to do that because they don't have this sideways throwing motion. When you think about Federer's forehand, what we all would all, I would say, agree this is really top technique. That's what he has. And that's what we don't see by many girls. And there is a lot of discussion about should they all play like this or that. I don't think that we can play all like Federer. We should not copy his 
forehand, but we all should have the skill to, to do what I call sideways throwing motion. If you don't have it, you will not be able to find that technique. If you have it, you can then play and you can find your own style. An excellent example is Del Potro. If you look on on the uh, internet, you will find uh, his match when he was playing uh, Orange Bowl final. He was really doing almost like, let's call it Federer style forehand. And you, you can imagine Del Potro's forehand uh, now when he was top. It was pretty straight arm and so on. So he was finding it because of his game style, deep penetrating shots. But it's not that he can't. So it's not that you have to play like Federer because the main thing, and there is research done about it. The difference is actually that with smaller uh, difference in uh, adjusting in, uh, during the back, uh, back swing, if you have this, let's call feather ATP style of forehand, you can actually vary amount of spin by the, by the shot. But when you have a swing like this, like Serena, perhaps best forehand in the female game, so it's nothing wrong, but if she wants to add spin, what you always see is she's like pulling up the shoulder and change the movement much more. You understand what I mean? So actually, basically, if, the, if you want your players to play with more variations in spin, then this technique is the right one. If you are going for the deep, penetrating shots, what is the base of the modern female game, you don't need so much. It's related what type of game you want to play. So I don't want to say there is one way to hit the forehand, but sideways throwing motion, I would like that every kid has it as a fundamental, and then see how to include it in his game style. Please. Like music. music. Anyway, the key message, as I hear mm -hmm. now, is it's too late. If you don't start too early with this, yes. and if you start too early, you will make it. Because later on, whatever we play tennis in 10 years in forward or 40 years, we don't know whether we'll play. But if you don't start, start early, yeah. you can't do this. No, you will not be able to. Because we all know that the best time to a window of opportunity to develop coordination technique is up to 12. So, and I see my wife doing this, throwing those stones. It's quite difficult. Difficult. Yeah. A little bit over 50. She can't. Can't. It they don't have it. I don't know how you they learn it, but I, when I recall how I learned it, we played as a kids in the park. What kids now they do much less. And then we take some stones or something from the, uh, like a fruit. And then what you do, you are behind the, behind the tree and you try to hit the, the guy on the, to the other side. So intuitively you find the sideways throwing, throwing motion. Nobody was teaching us this. And many fundamental motor skills before we were learning by playing in the, in the nature. Nowadays the kids are much more at home, don't discover this movement. So I believe we have to be aware about it as coaches and add it in our programs. So that's uh, perhaps also a very important message. This was the goal with this workshop. Did you get the key points? Do you think that? Yeah. So this was very close, of course, for two hours, yeah. one and a half hour. Yeah. True. The message was that start early. And put it. I would like to finish with this actually summary. I will not repeat again and uh, just let you read. And I would like to thank you for your, yes. Stamina, because I was now talking for one hour, 25 minutes. I hope it was interesting and that you got some ideas. And uh, yeah, I'm here if there are any questions, because I, I didn't answer everything in, in this one and the 20, uh, one hour uh, presentation. So please, thank you very much. Sorry? Come back one slide, I missed it. Ah. <laughs> So, any questions? <laughs> Either everything is clear or I, tot or I totally confused you now. <laughs> you don't know what to say. I hope not, really. No, like when, when, when you know it, the discussion WTA and ATP for it, mm -hmm. it was like also like the mm -hmm. kind of big backswing. Yes. Where ladies have like a, that upper body rotation and our racket shows up on the, up, on the mm -hmm. opposite side. Yeah, but because they try to find 
the source of acceleration. The less you are using trunk, the more you have to use the swing. You understand what I mean? So, but there is not saying, because now if I would show you uh, no, uh, Del Potro, he's having quite a big swing, but also he's a very strong guy. So it's possible here for him, even with extended arm, because extended arm means bigger uh, moment of inertia. You understand what I mean, yeah? So that's, and then in order to overcome this bigger moment of inertia, you can do it with the bigger swings, or from him, like, well, by him here, because he's strong. He's a very strong guy. So it's related to your body type also. Yes. Yes. No. No. It's interesting when I was making research, uh, which is the comparable movement in other sport? Discus throw. Actually, when you look at the technique of discus throw, actually the, the girls, the ladies, are using even more this separation angle, let's say like this, even more, uh, I would say, bigger movement of the trunk. So it's not a problem for the girls. But the... Uh, But it's not like this on the, on the yes, right. why? Because they don't use the trunk as a source of the throwing motion. Yeah. So what they are using is more like a pendulum. Yeah. This is pendulum motion. Yeah. And throwing is when it's from the side, and let's call it like whipping, that we don't go in details. But the problem is that actually when you make like this, then you have to make elbow, you have to come closer, and then it's coming now to one important point. When I come here, in order to accelerate the, accelerate the racket, I have to use so-called internal rotation of the arm. And the internal rotation of the arm, if you want to try, is this. And this is, this is the key. If I make this one, uh, and then bring the elbow closer, and now I hit, now I use this internal rotation, in which direction my racket goes? I do, in which direction, tell me. It's easy question. In which direction my racket goes? Forward, from back forward. But when you use the throwing motion, like Federer, he will be using this movement he will make here, and he will be using, now, now look where my racket goes. Because internal rotation you can observe when you look at my lateral uh, side of the, uh, of the elbow. When I now move elbow up, where the racket goes? And that's related to what? To horizontal speed or to spin? To spin. Because this movement is the difference between two techniques that actually you are using this movement here, nothing wrong, but then you get more power. When you're using it in front, like Federer, then this movement is supporting pronation and is actually responsible for adding spin here in front. You, can you connect? Because I, that's another presentation I have, but this is the difference. And because you can do it here, it's much easier to add more or less. If it's here, you use this, you don't have this movement, because if you do it now more, it will go down. Then, it, like Serena is doing this, but then she's going more with the shoulder up, if you can imagine how she's doing. So she found a way. I don't want to say that it's what she, Serena is doing is a bad shot, forget it. How many, 20 grand slams, so, <laughs> and say to her that she has a bad forehand. <laughs> So I'm not going about right and wrong. I'm more talking about opportunities. If you have one or the other style, you will have different tactical opportunities, let's say like this. So, do we, so the approach is not going to be different between boys and girls? No, at the beginning not. Yeah. I look at Sakari, think about Henan. They had this style of forehand, so it's not a problem of power, actually. It's a problem of technique. I mean, technique, it's not a problem, it's a, how to say, it's an it's a issue of technique. And I strongly believe that if we develop this sideways throwing motion by all the kids up to the age of 11, 12, they have opportunity to include it in their style, include. So you saw my son has really good this movement, but now when he's playing, he's not using it. He, he plays still with a pretty... I would call it straight arm. Why? Because it's much easier for him to have control. So I'm not teaching him now to make um, Federer's forehand. 
But the other guy that you saw that was having really a problem, he's still playing very stiff with much less combination of different movements from upper arm, lower arm, and wrist. So he's much more stiff, less opportunities to add different spin, less variability of the movement. And I want that all the kids develop this variability. So you, can, you have options. Then, then what will be your decision, like Del Potter after that? That he wants to play, I, I would say, more like a female style ground strokes. Is it bad? No. <laughs> it's about effectiveness. It's not about how it looks like. <laughs> so please don't get me wrong. I don't want to promote one style. I would like to explain biomechanics between the styles and then to look at the player and how I he wants skills. to play. I get the skills. Exactly. Oh, yes. skill. And then, and then you as a coach with the player have to find optimal playing style for your player and technique that will support that playing style. There is no one way in tennis and that's great. <laughs> because we have a great sport with different players, different playing styles. <laughs> we just started. <laughs> no, great. Thank you. So no more questions because of Ula. Thank you very much one more time. I hope there will be another option to talk. Thank you.